wizard for the last 20 years. And I'm, uh, not, uh, I'm fun employed right now, and I don't work for Oracle anymore, and I haven't started my new job at Deep Haven Provider Clark in September, so uh, I don't need a legal slide, which would otherwise be here, because basically <laughs> what you're hearing is, is pure unlock of me, and no, no employer can get into what, what, what I'm saying here. Um, so since we have some things to get through, I'll, I'll, I'll do a fairly quick pace and slow me down or catch me at the beach or whatever and ask me questions afterwards. Um, but this is, this is my story, my experience, and, and um, other versions may vary, so this is completely subjective what I've done with the Java world since I, I first entered it in 96 or so. And um, I've done computer history and things at, at, at various other conferences before. And I submitted this to Java 1, but the fascists in the core Java track didn't think it was good enough and uh, had problems with my loyalty in the Oracle team, so I'll give me two here instead. Um, so, so I've talked about computer history before, but uh, from, from this like, bare uh, personal perspective in this presentation. So follow me on Twitter and ask questions on Twitter if you have anything, because I've, I've, I've been in, in the Java world for a while, in the VM world for a while, and uh, the bits and the silicone and stuff that goes on beneath the surface, I've, I've pretty much done it all. So, so anyone curious about any implementation details or like general runtime nerdiness, send me a question on Twitter and I will answer and possibly retweet if it's, it's available. So, so this is a presentation about what I've been doing with, with my life for the last 20 years. And, and uh, it, it's very parallel with my professional life to what Java has been doing in the last 20 years. You don't need to see this like blown up, but it's basically the, the, the Java timeline. Uh, what's been going on since 95 when Java 1.0 was in beta uh, up to like Java 8 and, and modern Java releases. So somehow I've been involved in almost all of this on, on various levels. So um, I have, um, have a lot of depth here that I, I don't even know how to begin to map. But if you ask me obscure questions, I would be able to answer them better than maybe the average man in the street when it comes to Java technology. So I'm going to try to be historical, uh, because everyone likes uh, computer history. Um, I'm going to try to be nostalgic, and um, I'm going to uh, basically focus on Java for 20 years. Uh, it's going to be around 20 years. We had cake at the Oracle office uh, to celebrate this been around for 20 years, uh, and, and longer if you count the alphas and betas of Java 1.0. So, so this is 20 years of runtime from, from an engineering perspective. Uh, for me, this started in uh, 98 when I was drafted to a company called Appeal Virtual Machines in Stockholm, uh, who decided to uh, do their own JVM, which was the JRocket JVM, which got acquired by Oracle in, in 2008, because uh, uh, we were consultants first, and um, our customers bumped into various late 90s problems like scalability, stop the world garbage collections, running multiple threads wasn't possible, and things that have sort of faded into the obscure past, but the classic VM, uh, people wanted to use Java grow faster than the classic JVM uh, turned into something that they could use uh, to utilize the performance that they needed from the legacy systems. So that's why we uh, started as a consulting company and then turned into a product org when we discovered this need that all our clients had the same need. Um, then we were acquired by BEA in 2002, then BEA was acquired by Oracle in 2008, and then or Oracle acquired Sun in 2010, and then pretty much all Java development ended up in one place. This is not necessarily a good thing, but that's uh, little fish, big fish eat little fish and so on. So, so, so right now, um, a lot of the stuff I'll talk today I've experienced from within this big red uh, square, uh, but, but not all of it, far from all of it. There's always IBM and Azul. There's always IBM and Azul, and well, what we did at BEA and Appeal. Um, and I've written a book on, on JVM Eternals, so I'll, I'll blatantly commercial plug it here. Uh, it says Oracle J Rocket Definitive Guide. It's actually uh, much more generic than that, so uh, if you're interested in Java Runtime Eternals, you can, you can probably buy this guy. And um, also Java Mission Control, which is about half the book written by Marcus Hurt, who should be in this building somewhere today. Uh, perfectly applies to, to Java 8 and Java 9 as well. Even the APIs that the GUI editor described in the book will be things that are published in the, uh, in the Hotspot JVM in the near future. Um, so if you're interested in, in how it's different from like standard compiler tech working in runtimes, this is, this is quite a cool book. I don't necessarily sell many of them, but it's a cool book. So uh, I have to go back in time to, um, to see how, uh, how I ended up in, in, in Java land. And uh, it started somewhere in 95. 
Um, if we go a little bit too far, uh, to, to 1984, uh, a boy gets his uh, first computer, which is sort of the uh, fundamental event, my Commodore 64, that uh, made me interested in, in, in run times in the first place. Uh, because when I was 9 or 10, I realized I could write programs in BASIC using the C64 uh, manual, but there was something going on. The BASIC was interpreted in real time to machine language and executed. And there was an abstraction layer below, and if I directly used that abstraction layer, wrote my first 6502 assembly programs, <laughs> they ran, in fact, 50 to 100 faster than whatever was going on in BASIC. So, uh, as a young child, I understood abstraction la layers and uh, overhead converting between them. So, so for all practical purposes, Commodore Basic 2.0 is a is a virtual machine, right? So, uh, so that was that was how we started. I actually have that written in bread box somewhere in my, my dad's house. I found my Vic 20s uh, that I actually got later and used to can cannibalize for parts for my C64, but I didn't actually find the original bread box. But I know it's in there somewhere. Uh, my dad is a hoarder, so it's really hard to actually get all the legacy hardware that we start in the, in, the, in, in the piles. So, um, just quick detour into Commodore 64 land. We have to go back to the early 90s now, uh, which is uh, Project Green at Sun Microsystems. Um, they started uh, doing what turned into Java, uh, but it's like at this time it was a portable architecture for home electronics as we started out. Uh, programming remote control in, in something that was interpreted as basically the original research purposes with the sun. And um, at this time I was still at university and uh, I scraped together enough money to build my first uh, actual high performance PC that I could do something that was like Pentium 90 at this time. And, and, and me and my classmates were like, wow, CPU frequencies, they're like in the FM map, where will this end? So, so a lot has happened in, in, in 16 years, it's certainly, uh, 20, 21 years in this case, a lot, a lot, a lot has happened. So at the same time in Santa Clara, um, the language that, that was going to turn into Java was called Oak, the green spawn Oak, uh, which they, they realized that better applications to just programming with remote controls and embedded systems uh, because like the World Wide Web was being born at this time, the World Wide Web and the internet was completely synonymous terms. So they, they, they finalized a deal with Netscape um, to, to ship with uh, <coughs> like support for Java applets. They added things like the last week before they shipped to Netscape, like JSR and the RET instruction and other things that we'd had to support since time immemorial really hurt. So uh, standards uh, are, never, are never beautiful and good. They, they end up where they end up because of the market. And, uh, and Java is, is, is just another example of that, right? Um, there's nothing magical about it. But what was interesting here was well, the first series right once run anywhere. Uh, run everywhere uh, paradigm that that was widespread that, that took off. There's been several of those in modern history, but this was the first one that sort of was popularized because it was in the right place at the right time. But it was a, as they said then, a network aware language, basically meaning that it had a powerful enough APIs to to do internet programming things that uh, uh, that you wanted to do it these days. Because uh, I mean. Young developers of today, those are spoiled. They can use Rust, or they can use Python, or they can use whatever. But back in those days, it was basically C++ plus a Java. So, so Java took off because of that. We didn't have the diversity at all we have in today's world. So, so Internet meant the World Wide Web. And in uh, 96, the first JDK was released with 1.02. Uh, there were some betas and alphas available before. So Microsystems got them out. It was integrated in the Netscape uh, Navigator. And um, I worked even with alphas of uh, JDK 1.0 as a re research intern at, at Ericsson's Media Lab in Stockholm, uh, which was modeled basically on the MIT Media Lab experience. So I had a very early contact with the Java language as such, and I noticed how small, um, how primitive the JVM and the JDK were then, and how much they delivered compared to what else you had. So using these save icons, 3D printed save icons, I could, uh, I, I could move an entire JDK between, say, university and school, bandwidth with was better than using my modem to do the same thing. So we were still like very magnetic media uh, back at this time. And the GDK actually fit to one of these. It was less than 1.44 uh, megabytes, uh, first, uh, the first version of the GDK that was released. Uh, so sneaking that was, was the way to go because the, the v 42 bis uh, modem certainly wasn't up to it. Uh, and, and wow, I mean, storage is so cheap these days and uh, bandwidth is so cheap these days, but back in those days, it's quite, quite a night and day difference. Um, 
And there were various applets in the beginnings. At the beginning, applets took off. Everyone was writing applets. You didn't see much like server-side Java or Java client programming. It was applets about the browser and websites with applets. And it just seemed pretty limited at the time, but there was some kind of, kind of religious mania having to do with applets. Uh, so during my internship at Ericsson Media Lab in the summer of 96, which had the, the business model, play with Ericsson's future and see what you can do with broadband if you have broadband. Um, we, we were supposed to do something like media on demand using new technology. So, so that's how I got introduced to Java, as, as a user of Java first. And uh, we did a media on demand system for, for music and video called Mozart back in the time. It was basically uh, could face the client either as a desktop uh, AWT app or, or as an app in a web browser uh, using pretty much all the features that you could do and hack the rest. Spliced in native code with Java didn't work because there was like lots of user experience and lots of programming that had to be done. So, so we basically did Spotify and Netflix in an applet in '96. So, so I mean, Java proved its point. It could be used for um, a lot more rapid software development than, say, C++. Ericsson, the same company, had bet their entire world on doing the AXEN uh, telephone exchanges and wrote in C++. And after 1.5 million lines of code, I think it burned horribly. I can't really remember, but uh, there were uh, there was a demand for alternative languages that, that we didn't have back in the mid '90s. And today, this brass says, "Oh, this is brass. This is Haskell. This is Erlang. Whatever." But C++ and Java really are these days, and then that, that's. I think the job was in the right place in the right time that made it, made it grow so powerful. And, and the uh, uh, decoding and stuff we did with MPEG hardware cards, because that software and computers weren't really that fast though. So that was Java 1.0, which was a pure bytecode interpreted language. Well, I had this, unit, uh, this professor at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, and suddenly he was proud of his toy research language because it was also interpreted because he had the time to, to write a JIT and said, look, Java is interpreted lines to look at the credits gets me. So, so sure, uh, immature, uh, and maybe it didn't last long. And then from the start, as you all know, the Java memory model was, was horribly broken and basically invalidated any optimization that it just compiler would do if you um, read it, stuck to it fundamentally. Uh, more about that in my book if you're interested in exactly what issues are. And Java 1.0 added a lot of unsafe methods that were deprecated, still haven't been removed, which I'm sad to say, but they were deprecated in the very next release next year. So you don't get stuff right. Everything is an incremental process. Sometimes, like deprecating unsafe, which was never meant for public consumption, it's more, um, more um, uh, intrusive uh, than otherwise, but uh, sometimes you just have to say deprecated and generate warnings and move on. So it, it was very 1.0. Uh, but still it took off. Gosling said that your development cycle is much faster because Java is interpreted. Okay. The compiling, load, test, crash, debug cycle is obsolete, he said. Uh, okay. And I got the same argument from JavaScript kid is today, so I guess history repeats itself. Uh, not necessarily, only for, for good reasons. So we founded a consulting <coughs> company while we were still finishing our master's degrees in Stockholm, me and a couple of friends. Uh, it was called Appeal Software Solutions. I got in as, as the last guy there. And uh, we had more job experience than anyone else around us at that time. So we started selling consulting uh, services uh, based on Java and some UML because um, that has to be suffered in the world. It won't, uh, it won't grow as a person. So typical mid-90s web design is our website that I've been able to scrape from the Internet Archive. And of course, if you see the movie The Net with uh, Sandra Bullock, you have this pie icon that you can click in the uh, uh, lower right corner for the Easter egg. If you haven't seen it, you check it out. It's, it's horribly cheesy. Um, so, yeah. No, it's not still alive. Uh, so, so in 97, uh, Java on the client side, we could spot this already in 97, wasn't really taking off. Like, people, there's limited usability to what applets can do in the browser, right? And, uh, a lot of our customers, though, uh, they have started to rewrite service items in Java because the right ones run anywhere, uh, memory management that was built in, and buffer overrun protection uh, that they were given for free um, was uh, speeding up the software development process a lot. And again, remember, C++ was the alternative, so of course it sped up the software process, development process a lot, even though Java was sort of slow at the time. And um, 
This was the dawn of application servers. Again, people started to write the primordial logic code here and primordial J2E standards haven't specialized in anything. So the larger the service lines apps grow, uh, the more apparent it was that we have performance <coughs> bottlenecks in, in the classic VM job. So, so this already in 97, we saw the prehistoric trail towards enterprise job and service side job. And uh, we started noticing more and more customer complaints about that. So in 97, this is Java 1.1. Uh, introduce inner classes, Java Beans, JDBC, RMI, live with the reflection. You see the first JITs, for example, Semantic on Windows, I think was the actual first third party JIT ship before Sun shipped the simple product. And um, Sun introduced serialization, which uh, Oracle is still apologizing for. So it, it's sensitive. Don't say it when, when you're near Brian Gutz because he will just grow and apologize. So, I mean, historical mistakes you have them. And in 97 was our last year at university, finishing up a master's degree. So we won a programming contest. There are actually three other guys at our, our little consulting firm won a programming contest. Look how young they are. To, to go to Java 1 as a result um, between various Swedish universities. And uh, they, they, they got a paid trip to Java 1 in 97, where some microsystems presented the hotspot virtual machine, which was based on an acquisition of Anamorphic, Lars Bark, and various other people uh, who had self, small self background. And, and we immediately saw, wow, well, this is the way to implement Java because you have so much runtime linkage, you have so much uh, uncertainty that you can't prove. Like, you, don't, you can't close the world in Java because mobile well, code can enter the system at any time. So, obviously, the small talk way to do this uh, with adaptive compilation and adaptive garbage collection policies and modifying the behavior at runtime, that's the way to implement Java. This, this will solve all our clients' problems. It's great. 98, so Java 1 2 with Swing. AWT still remains, even though it should have been deleted a long time ago, but it's deprecated for you. Um, actually, Swing should have been deleted a long time ago. Um, strict FP, because Intel is horrible. Um, there was a JIT in the classic VM for the first time in 98. The collection CPI came in, and uh, the JK triples in size. And suddenly, these 15, 20 classes, which doesn't seem like a lot today, but it was then, didn't fit on the floppy anymore. We still use floppies, but we had zip drives, so that was fine. Uh, JDK 1.2 did not fit in a floppy drive. Uh, and that was the same programming competition. And since not everyone had had the degrees yet at the office, they decided to enter again. So we had three, three same guys won the programming contest again because they were unbeatable. And they got a free trip to Java 198 where some microsystems presented an hotspot virtual machine again. Slide by slide, the exact same presentation was last year, um, which sort of added some frustration because we had thought that Hotspot would be out any day soon now, like 1.0 version of Hotspot would rock and the customers would be able to run their stuff really fast. But no, nope, this was the same as last year. So we said like, we can wait in the longer, let's build our own JVM or it be. So, so that, that was the start of the JRocket JVM. Uh, we basically decided that we don't need to wait for some microsystems, they're never going to ship this anyway. So we figured in six months we'll have everything up and running. So uh, we decided to, to pull this off. We recognized that we still we had to prioritize an narrow domain and like the entire Java implementation to start. So we targeted service side only, which was the main customer case that we had in the consulting business. And people made money on that. So if uh, we could help like early apps or vendors and other service side job people to get performance and scalability better than, uh, than the Sun offerings, we could sell it. So that was one of the early things, decisions we did in the JRocket source was we don't need a bytecode interpreter because startup doesn't matter anyway, which is a big lie, but we thought that then. And uh, we were in the on the verge of implementing a, uh, an interpreter, a native interpreter, and a Java JIT in uh, 2010 when Oracle acquired Sun. The first is drop a beautiful JRocket code base, so, so we were obviously re-evaluating this over time. On the other hand, we ended up with a really, really fast JIT that was faster than C1 and produced better code because we fast and we didn't have any interpreter to fall back on. 98 PEA, which like had a called Tuxedo for their WebLogic needs, acquired WebLogic, and WebLogic becomes one of the first drivers for the J2EE specification standard, which was still fluent at this time. And uh, another thing that was rampant during the late 90s is that people thought that, well, Java is slow, so we can translate it into C code and compile it with GCC, and everything will run really nicely. Look how fast it is. And that worked for closed world assumptions, but it doesn't really work for Java. So these things ended up with monstrosities of like pulling in new code, generating new code, compiling it into a DLL, and loading it in the C 
executable and other things wholly incompatible with like how Java was meant to run, but they didn't care because they made money. So there was Tower J, was, was a big player here, and there was Excelsior Jet, and, and basically just combined everything to C and run GCC, and, and it didn't really, it wasn't really compatible with these guys who like bought condos in Palo Alto for $500,000 so they could have like an overnight place in the late 90s to sleep. Um, so, so there was money in this before, before the GVMs caught up. So we used our consulting business to finance J-Rocket development, uh, the J-Rocket GVM, while we hunted for VanCap at the same time. And this was the time, like in the dot-com era, when if you presented a business model that wasn't spamming people's cell phones with text message ads or running a mail order store on the web, you didn't get any money because people didn't really understand it. Uh, but eventually we ended up with, with funding, sole part of ourselves, a really tough options deal to the investors, and uh, started spending our nights reading academic papers to understand like how the self-world progressed to the Java world and how we could apply it. And in 2000, um, Java by Gartner Group was identified as the fastest growing programming language in the world. And at the same time as the dot-com bubbles, so it was bad timing. And Nasdaq hit 5,000 just before the tech break, just like it did a couple of months ago, so uh, watch out. Also, I'm in Greece, so you don't need to know any more warnings about economy and bubbles. Um, we needed a Java license to call ourselves Java. Sun sells these things. Um, you can't call yourself Java without a Java license. You can't call yourself Java without passing the secret TCK test suite that Sun sells to you when you have the Java license. And to get the Java license, to apply to buy one, which is about a million dollars a year, or was at that time, you need a value add. You can't just be Java, you need a value add. So what's a value add? So we basically said that, okay, we're the JROC JVM, and our value add, we haven't built cakes with this motif, our value add is superior performance. We're going to kick hotspots ass in any configuration, but for some reason, Sun lawyers uh, and marketeers didn't like that. So we, we pulled another value add out of our ass, which was like manageability. And, and, and manageability started out with uh, a monitoring console that could connect to, to a running application and just look what it was doing in real time. And this eventually turned into Java Mission Control, but back then it was just like the Mission Control console. And that was accepted as a value add, so we used that to get our Java license and we paid them up. Uh, and in 2000, also the JK13 release came out from Sun, which was the dreaded Kestrel, when Hotspot was the default uh, JVM in the JDK. It was really, really buggy at this time. You looked at it the wrong way, it went into the infinite loop in C2. Um, and um, there was JNDI, JPDA, RMI, Corba, which still produces warnings in the open JDK. Today, the Java Sound API, other not so uh, not so important uh, API changes, um, and we released in the first quarter of 2000 here at 1.0, which was basically just geared towards running Java with many threads starting and dying, chat servers, early trading apps, and things like that. So we had a very small niche where we multiplexed green threads on native threads, MYM, and um, the other JVMs didn't do that. So we actually sold some licenses because of this. Uh, and we were stupid enough to write that in the year-end financial statement, which caused us to be mercilessly raped by the tax office in 2004 after we sold appeal to VEA. So, so never tell anyone publicly that you make making money or actually have customers. That's a good thing. At least at the tax office. So 2001. This seemed like a science fiction year when we started. And uh, we broke out a virtual machine shop from the consulting company Appeal Software Solutions and uh, finally got a Java license, uh, mostly because I'm Tim Lindholm's friend and he felt sorry for us, but uh, I'm sure that the people who have worked on Android and Google have had similar experiences. They were also encouraged by the same Tim Lindholm who got a Java license when they came into Android and they didn't do that. I'm not going to comment either way, but the, it, it would have been an exit that, that would have cost less millions of dollars. Um, so we had the manageability value add, shipped the prior, uh, uh, a mission control console, nothing else at this time, and uh, the static compiler mindset was still very strong. It was very hard to sell the adaptive runtimes as a concept, both for us and for Hotspot. Intel didn't understand it at all. They did not want to invest in this. They did not, even if they said we can help you do IT new JITs, IE64, which was all the rage in 2001, we, can still, we can't still. Um, they still didn't understand the concept of adaptive runtime. They, they understood static compilers, that was Intel was about. So that was very frustrating having these arguments. I had, I think, 13 US entry stamps in my passport for 2001, so while, while officially living in Sweden. So that, that year wore me out a bit. 
Uh, and then we started meeting BEA, uh, where Logic was selling a lot. And they wanted performance and scalability yesterday, which Hotspot didn't give them, the classic VM didn't give them. So we said, let's drop everything for a small company, focus on meeting BEA's demand. And um, eventually BEA said, like, we'll cooperate with you Intel, we like the Intel platform, and we'll acquire a few virtual machines. You probably shouldn't, because they'll, they'll quit and, and slice the wrists. So that was actually probably the best scenario, given the cash reserves we had at the time, and given the interest we had in scaling the service at Java that uh, we got acquired by BEA. Um, Intel introduced the Itaniums, one of the early deals we uh, uh, jumped on here on to get money was to uh, create an Itanium JIT. In 2006, when we finally stopped creating the uh, Itanium JIT, I was the compiler lead for JRocket and took about 60% of my engineering time and it was about 3% of my engineering customers. So I said that this is not feasible to maintain. It's not okay for the compiler to have to solve every complete problem to generate efficient code, screw in order execution. And uh, I was 23, like when I sat in, in, in Intel meetings and they introduced the Itanium and said, it's so cool, you don't have like any integer arithmetic. You cast off the floating points, you let the FPU do the multiplications. This is going to be great. And I was like, maybe I'm just 23 years old, but I mean, this is going to burn. And it did. So. Um, lots of effort in Greece on the square wheel, it was the Itanium, and they paid a lot of money for us to maintain a decent Itanium port, but it's not possible in software to do a really good JIT for Itanium. Perhaps a static compiler, uh, but not a JIT. Uh, so we spent a lot of time with the uh, binary translation folks in Israel, uh, doing like x86 backwards compatibility, and we did our JVM and the uh, Itanium JIT, demoed at the various venues. And, and I was in San Mateo, a large part of 2001, sitting with these non-FCC compliant boxes that would wobble CRT on my, uh, on, on my desk because they weren't FCC compliant and full of electronics that uh, probably gave me future prostate cancer. Uh, so that was the Itanium. 2001 was the year of the Itanium, but it's, we grew out of it. Also, uh, at about this time, uh, the uh, uh, JDK, uh, the Open JDK process, formalized as JSRs and was launched as a community process, which was a very good thing. Uh, so Merlin, which I think is JDK 1.4, was the first project that actually went through the uh, Java community in a semi-open or open way. So it was an interesting development. It was released in 2002. Um, added certs, regex, exception, get calls, like change exceptions, NIO, which was basically Solaris APIs turned into Java. So if anyone from community actually give an input. I will hope that looked otherwise, but no. Um, logging API, global single, as you know. Um, image IO, XML, IPv6. Um, so when it comes to what we did in Stockholm, then we had eventually had four value adds. We were acquired by BEA, and they said, okay, now how are you going to make money? Because you have promising server-side scalability in your JVM, because you've concentrated on that. So we, we ended up finding four value adds I'll talk about. So, so we turned into BEA in 2002. The first value was very simple. Sudden didn't have any 24-7 support that you could pay for for the JVMs. BEA had, so we basically integrated JROC with the support organization. Like very conservative customers, those who refused to upgrade Java versions um, six days after their deprecated Japanese banks, that kind of people actually wanted to pay to get the multi-tier support process they couldn't get from Sun. So that's how we started making money, just like adding a support for tier layer. Then the manageability work, which is really was the excuse for us to get a Java license, Java Mission Control. Um, we started, uh, the management console was the first tool in the Mission Control Suite that was shipped. And uh, when people realized they could hook up to production overheads, the production system was virtually zero overhead because the JVM already had the data. They didn't need to recompile with JVM, TV, JVM DI at the time. They didn't need bytecode instrumentation. We actually saw some small revenue with this from, from pre-sales and the services in the field. And it grew bigger and bigger as, as web machine control uh, got better. So it was actually one of our two main monetizers when uh, our acquired BEA was, was mission control suite. And we're not nearly back at the technically advanced level we were in 2008 in Hotspot, because Hotspot, but we're getting there. We're lacking the memory leak detector, for instance, but, but it's being worked on. So I have great hopes that mission control will work, and also that uh, you'll get public APIs so you can contribute your own events in the open as part of the open code base, it's Java 9 which I know will be the case. And um, 
It's 2003, 2004, some harder observations in order. All the clock rate curves started to flatten out faster than people had in the workhorse. You have to optimize the JVMs for NUMA, for hyperthreading, for things like that. And Java still has explicit threads. You did a new Java line thread in 2003. There were no thread pools, no fork join pools, no implicit parallelism at all. So, in order execution, as I said, for the IT team, is a really bad idea for JITs because it's really hard uh, computationally to schedule code when the hardware does it so much better. So, um, already here, the predicted sales of the IT team start to fall way below what it thought. We had that on our desktop wall. IT team say actual sales and predicted sales for every year. They just did that down. And, uh, we knew that from the beginning, but it didn't listen. So, so it's still the. Uh, Adaptive runtime equation still holds, the execution time is the runtime overhead and the program runtime, where the runtime overhead is things like garbage collection or locks or any time not spent executing your program actually. So um, we, we're moving to multiple world. We have to move away from explicit parallelism because you can't expect you know, how many cores are in your machine and how parallel your stuff should be. I mean, you should just be able to work with streams with similar metaphors and it should, should be there like you got from Java 8 and fork join pools in Java 7, right? So, JDK 5, which is the numbering scheme, uh, Tiger, another JSR, 176 at this time, uh, was the biggest release of Java so far. I think it almost doubled uh, the Java size. It had generics, it had annotations, which made the J2EE app server world uh, very happy. I've never worked with Java EE, but uh, as far as I understand it, it's just a Java program that meta interpret itself using annotations and classes and methods. Um, and, um, Autoboxing and unboxing, which was great for the code, but not so great for Hotspot because C2 is still bad at escape analysis, so it still leaves boxing in. Uh, enums, for args, static imports, and a concurrent package, which uh, was Doug Lee's first version. This is the first step towards more implicit parallelism already in 2004, which is cool. And also, we finally fixed the job memory models, the compiler optimizations that I've been doing for, for, for almost nine years were actually legal to do as of 2004. Not that anyone cared. So, for the first time in history, because Itanium was such a horrible shipwreck, um, AMD is in its lunch. They, they did a backwards compatible x86 architecture with the x86 64. More registers, same assembly code, wider register bandwidth, and um, very early adoption. Like they, they, they got the entire world to adopt this, and that was like the death blow of the Itanium already here. It took a few years before it acknowledged that, but but uh, people wanted backwards compatibility, which is the same. It's also true for Java. So, sorry about Jigsaw, guys, because otherwise we've been pretty good at that for 20 years. And the 64 bit world enabled exabytes of virtual memory space. So, this is a period that I call the benchmark wars. Basically, everyone was running spec JV, spec the app server, whatever the small piece of the real world benchmarks are called, and then I would post the results on the spec website. So. Uh, and according to the rules, 90 days after you had a benchmark result, you had to publish the bits that generated that result. So, uh, BEA, Sun, and IBM were the three big JVM vendors, ended up uh, putting a lot of performance releases in, in very hard to find places on the web uh, because they weren't that stable. But during this time, uh, us three, it was quite a country competition because it's an eminently measurable management goal they could tie to bonuses. So, so we had really high pressure on all three companies to actually produce really good industrial size benchmarks scores. So SpecTV M98 was the benchmarks this time. Immemorial was one of them, SpecTV benchmarks and SpecTV app server benchmarks. Where it actually mattered if you bought Cisco's, which for a million dollars I put in there, you get higher scores. So there was some ridiculous funding from the three sides because, wow, it's a quantifiable goal. And everyone in management and HR thinks that, I mean, only quantifiable things are worth mentioning, right? Everything can be quantified, and if it doesn't even make up, have to quantify it, no matter how wrong it is, but this was quantifiable. But it was actually good, because from all the three JVM vendors, this has brought a lot of real world optimizations. So this is a small list, if you're interested in like more of the benchmark wars of what we did in the JIT and the GC, you can, you can read my book, Marx's book. But, but there's a lot of stuff that we invented just to be fast, I'll say spec JBB, which made JVMs faster in the real world, such as bias locking. Comparing GC, external internal heap compaction, of course, Hotspot still doesn't have external heap compaction. Uh, non contiguous heaps, uh, prefetch heuristics, partial escape analysis, of course, Hotspot doesn't have that either because of C2, 
but there's plenty of stuff that both us, IBM, and Sun invented during these times that, that made Java so much faster. And this benchmark might have been semi-synthetic, but they scale really well in some issues. They scale really well into the app server space, for instance. So, so Java uh, sort of became not the ugly cousin that wasn't running so fast. It became the language of choice for server-side programming because you had the performance during these years. And the people who basically, oh, C++ is faster than everything, they started to shut up during these years. And I feel really proud. It's one of my proudest professional victories to have been instrumental in this. So. Sure, it didn't seem so at the time. We ended up with some pretty cool technology because all three JVM vendors really invented stuff during these years. Just took my benchmarks. Of course, some took some shortcuts with the XX aggressive, which basically means don't have a garbage collect. Look how fast the benchmark is. But we never cheat. Um, so we had value about three, which was deterministic GC. And this was in 2006, 2007. I was in London uh, doing a lot of pre-sales at investment banks that I still can't name. Um, the biggest customer was one investment bank who didn't crash and burn in 2008, draw your own conclusions. And um, basically, we invented a GC algorithm um, that, that allowed you to specify quality of service level for pulse times. And in those days, total garbage collection time was higher, but you had a quality of service level, say, guaranteeing no pulse time would be more than five million seconds. They would buy it. And, and people like um, these investment banks could tell you in, in, in pounds sterling how much more money they made every day in their arbitrage taking system because they had lower pulse times. So they, they easily know, like, easily give me 20 CPU licenses because we make 140,000 pounds more uh, per day with your system. So that was quite interesting. Um, so telco finance mostly started to buy that, so except for mission control, the deterministic GC was our main other monetizer. It's still not an hotspot, it's being put there, both as low latency GC and as deterministic GC, they're sort of slightly different things. Um, and it's probably not going to be out in the nine time frame, but later, and it's most definitely going to be commercial if I know Larry. But it was commercial here too. Um, again, algorithm and research is in the book, it's typical garbage collections taken from this investment bank running a SIP server. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a telco, big American telco running a SIP server and the, the uh, 99th percentile of response times using normal garbage collection. Adding deterministic GC, total garbage collection time goes up, but after warm up, you have this deterministic behavior. And this apparently was worth a lot of money for people at the mid 2000 century, the first century of 2000. So we added limited flight recordings, the, JSR 174 monitoring API uh, was finalized. We designed something beautiful. Sun added a lot of mess, but uh, well, that's history for you. Uh, so mission control ships with its first versions, and uh, you have the zero overhead production time monitoring for the first time, which impressed people. Limited flight recordings, uh, called JRI, JRA files first, and now the JFR files. So it's the predecessor to flight recorder. It was extremely cheap because Use the runtime data that was there just to, to export the info. And no one had done that, no one had done the VM, no one had done the cycle. So, so the support used it a lot, and customers saw support using it and wanted to buy it. So that was actually quite interesting. The latency analysis tool was a typical example of what was cool in those days. What does your Java program do when it isn't um, running Java? Is it locks or is it waiting? What's going on? The memory leak detector, which is the final part of JF1, not to port to hotspot. Uh, go into a product uh, production environment, see what the trends in the heap are, something leaking, find the root sets, jump to the source code that's actually causing this memory leak. And then there's another like, support loves it. So I got very little left of my presentation, but it's still half time when it comes between like mid 90s and here. Um, 2006, some started to run into financial trouble. They pretty much bet the company on Java FX. And Mobile phones are everything, and um, it's a bit quiet for our side of the scene. Sun started communicating as much back to us when we needed Java license and problems and stuff. I know the brilliant people is at Sun were rerouted to do like write Java FX QA tests, even though they were world-class GC engineers. So obviously things can't have been too great financially. They came up with innovations like the Ask toolbar to make money, um, and, and Java FX was everything which they showed to Google and said, maybe you should steal our idea and not pay us any money for it, which of course Google did. So uh, Apache Harmony was the reaction to that. Um, rewrite class from scratch. Uh, IBM and others contribute a lot of code. 
I work with Alexi and still when he sees a sun copyright Heather, he reflexively closes the window because it was it was in those days, so it was very, very hard legal wise. Uh, we spent six months getting a J-Rock version drawn the Harmony Lips, which was uh, relatively painless. And even though Harmony went away, it eventually was one of the contributing factors that led Sun to open source the JVM JDK sources and the JPL V2. So JDK 6, which was the last job I released on the Sun stewardship, was uh, coding Mustang. It was released in December 2006. And the scripting support with Rhino, the compiler API for Java C, JDBC 4.0, and some dynamic language support, the MLVM project started, the discussions in the list started. And JSR 292, which is the Invoke Dynamic uh, Java Lang Invoke, Jeff was up for review. This took a lot of time, it's one of the bigger projects that we've done. People were running all kinds of things on the JVM, like this job. Actually, they've been doing that since 95, but, but more and more people were writing stuff to compile to Java Byte and ran on the JVM because it saved them tremendous amounts of effort. So dynamic languages are becoming trendy. Uh, JRuby already here leads growth, and um, Invoke Dynamic is getting finalized. BEA, IBM, and Sun will work in the process, so we contribute substantially to that spec. We had Freddy Garstrom, who now works for Spotify as a kind of patent lawyer. I don't understand him, but he was our JSR 292 contact and did a wonderful job. Um, so the Polygon JVM effort is getting bootstrapped already this far back. And, and bytecode, we realized that it's going to be a serialized Java. Uh, we don't have a runtime on the dispatch, but if we had that, it would be the first step to do dynamic languages in the JVM. And, and, and while this is true today, we didn't see as much of it in 2006, because things like Google V8 had still not been released, and JavaScript is still slow, but it's inevitable that the JVM turns into a polygon platform, I think, given things like closure as well. So virtualization is becoming trendy as well. JVM we realized just a special operating, specialized operating system that runs Java, so we wrote a linker to see what the JVM actually required from the OS. It wasn't that much already, really, so we started doing a Black Ops project called JROC Virtual Edition here in 2006, which was uh, an operating system that could only do one thing, run one JVM process. Because if you have the application server, the JVM, the OS, the hypervisor, or the hardware, you have triple virtualization. And if we just had a JVM running on a JVM operating system, we could really get rid of that. Whoops. I have no idea what happened. PowerPoint browser. That's fine, it's not very sensitive. PowerPoint crashed. Obviously. Thought it would. Microsoft Office products on Mac is like deliberately broken, I think. Um, I tried to convert this to Keynote and Keynote crashed, so I've sort of been stuck in a very bad place for a very long time with this presentation. Let's see if I can actually get to it. So the, the only reason why PowerPoint crashed is because it's very so sharp. You can't talk about Java with C Sharp. I'll be right back here. <laughs> I don't think it's written in C Sharp. I don't think so either, but it would make sense. <coughs> I was almost done, so. Um, right. Slideshow. Present to you. Am I on screen again? Right, so virtualized Java turned out to be pretty powerful because we could remove a lot of abstraction layers. When you had to have handles and copy buffers because you couldn't trust them into native, you could still hold on to the same buffer if you knew that the native was George VM. You could do it in my syscalls, you could do things like network IO and user land if you wrote your own TCP stack that was sitting like the GVM could use. You could rid of a lot of um, um, privileged transitions in the kernel if you had your own kernel. Uh, device drivers, that's what the hypervisor was for, that's what made this possible. And uh, we could even do things like having threads protect memory from other threads, because we own the road to the thread system, which enabled things like really cheap as well style read barriers for low latency GC. We actually did a really nice uh, proof of concept on that here. And the investment banking industry actually gave us some money to, to pursue this. Um, we, had, uh, we had a virtual Linux setup on the JRG VE running about 50% faster than physical Linux running WebLogic, so that was pretty awesome, actually. When we had the experimental zero overhead read barriers because we up implemented the operating system under the JVM. Sadly enough, uh, this ended in Oracle Balta, some diary said you can't talk to VMware anymore because I hate them. So, so basically, we, we lost 18 months of development there. Uh, 2007, Apache requested the, the TCK. doesn't get it from Sun. Uh, they want to work on Harmony. They say, okay, that will block every vote until we're friends again. So the JCP process stalled. Major fight between Apache and Sun already in 2007. So we tried to hedge our bets and had to implement a Harmony VM. And uh, 
also some came down on BEA and said, maybe we will not renew your Java license because we feel like it. Uh, you're threatening us. So, so that was actually going to be very problematic in early 2008. And also some had no language updates on the pipe for, for, for pretty much all the future. They fired all their QA, rehired Russians, and scaled on the force and said JavaFX is the one company priority. So as Java licensee, everything just got dark. And 2008, Oracle acquired BEA, and Larry sent expensive lawyers and Sun and said, give us your Java license or we'll shut you down, bitches. And, and that worked, apparently, because Larry had more expensive lawyers than Sun, but they, they tried to do a very uh, uncooperative thing there, just like shut us down because they could. Uh, so, we Oracle, interesting. So what we do there is we integrate with the Exadata and the Oracle Service Stack teams and optimize the rocket for uh, web logic, uh, running on uh, Exadata machines. And uh, it turns out to be the Oracle default JVM because we can get some really good performance out of it, but we can get this app, so we can get exactly the 66 requirements. We spend our time. And Oracle forces us to move from VMware to Zen, which was the beginning of the end of JRocket VE, because Larry hates VMware, and we had a really good cooperation. You call them in California in the afternoon in Stockholm and say, you have a buggy driver, and they'll send you bits in half an hour. Whereas Zen, like college kids in Cambridge, who uh, renamed every API, every point release. So, so we sat there in despair. Um, so there was a political vacuum here because Sun was, like, they didn't make money from the ASP tool bar this time, they had the job ethics thing going, and they were in serious financial trouble, and it was really hard to get any communication out of Sun, no job, no job 7 or anything that they promised. So in 2010, Oracle acquired Sun, and you should all be happy over here that it wasn't IBM who first acquired Sun, but Oracle, I mean, sure, different levels of hell, but I would still prefer Oracle over IBM when it comes to Google and Java any day. So Oracle is now Sun, and um, I had a, a breakout talk on Thursday called Acquiring Sun, where I'll go into details about that. But uh, basically, it was because of Zen and not VMware, we're going to continue with the JRock VE development, and there are plenty of market space is filling up now in the virtualized world these days anyway, but we were first, I think. And uh, we're going to look at code-based merges, which basically means throw away the JRocket source code that we refactored for JRocket R28 the last two years and adopt Hotspot, which no one has refactored ever and has no code standard. So we started adding stuff to, to the Hotspot code base, basically. Uh, Mission Control came out in Java 8, which is really nice. Uh, otherwise, it would basically go to the Hotspot code base. And here I got tired of the sun, so I, I uh, did a startup for, for a year or two before I was lured back to, uh, to Oracle. And uh, then I came back in the uh, uh, Java language team. And uh, still, when I came back in 2011, there haven't been any releases. Or what happened was, I think we released Java 7 about when I came back in 2011. The first release in six years, because Oracle wanted to push out the door as quick as possible. Uh, we got IBM to join the OpenJDK, Harvard retires, and finally the political block on the OpenJDK was gone, which is great. I mean, this, this is great, because finally the world started talking to each other instead, instead of being just like darkness that couldn't communicate with. So uh, I come back to the language team to work on Java 8 and Latin language at the JVM, which was a lot of fun. Uh, summer 2011, Java 7 Dolphin came out. Uh, I was in Java 1 in 2010, where everyone hated Oracle and said, you have to kill Java, everything sucks, everyone was working with their like, Ice on the floor and we're feeling bad, and I was Java 1 2011 after the Java 7 release. That was really why the gossip was back, and mm -hmm. the community was really happy that Java 7 finally got out, and so was I. So, so this overnight pretty much changed the mood of the Java world from pessimism to optimism, even within the Oracle Sun camp. It's changed. So I think that hadn't we gotten out Java 7 with as few features as we could as quickly as we could. It could have been potentially disastrous, but that was the decision made, and, uh, and people were really happy that finally there was a new Java release. So Java 7 was extremely well received, and it was a tipping point coming into goodwill, and uh, Oracle second Java 1 in 2011, I mean, there was a night and day difference between the one the year before, so it was really happy to be there. I felt energized by being here. So in the JVM, we have to have backwards compatibility, and we will always have to maintain it, with, of course, the caveat being Jigsaw. And, and some things may change, but fundamental compatibility will always be there. So I had a demo, if you're interested, hit me up on the beach and I can show you a binary that I compiled in 97 that uses like horrible demo scene hacks to do things with AWT that were never intended that still works if I run the Java on my laptop. So, um, 
Job 8 developments have just started picking up speed, 2011, 2012. The NASA project is, is delivered. Uh, it was one of the things we did to speed up Evoke Dynamic to understand why it was slow. Uh, job Mission Control got into Job 8 and backported to 7U40, and it's a wonderful tool. I use that every day, and, and you all should. It's free outside of production. And uh, we've got better build and test infrastructure. Um, with JRocket, you can basically just do continuous deployment, press a button on a fresh laptop, and you've got your build tools. When we acquired Sun, it's like, yeah, there's a wiki page, and it's probably not up to date, but you can sort of try finding where these things are on the internet and download them, and maybe you can build. You will get a thousand warnings. So that was quite a different, different approach to software engineering. But uh, now, five years later, I must say that building the OpenJDK, it's incredibly fast compared to working in the sun. Uh, you can do it with configure make, uh, there's still warnings, but we have like, every summer at JVMLS, we spend a few days like killing warnings together, and it's also incrementally. Finally, it's starting to look like some professional uh, project again that you can build, some open source project you can do configure make on. And um, again, credit to credit to you, Fred Gorstrom and Ricky also all the, guy, the engineers who did this, and it's absolutely wonderful because now I always, the version I always use is like my fresh build open JDK or fresh build sandbox repo. I don't use any binaries. I, I clone the source, I build it, it works fast. You can change anything, look at anything, and debug me on So this is one of the things that like never they never had it sun, which is completely inexplicable and we have it now. So anyone who's trying to build the open GDK will surely agree with me that like this is a night and day change. Crunch mode 2017. Security backlog, there was a huge security backlog in the six years of sun as well. And that was all I saw internally. I can't talk too much about it because NDA but the security backlog eventually went away. That was like the main priority of everything internally. And Java 8, which I'm happy to have been involved in, was released on March 18. And I would say it's the best Java release ever. Permanent removal, um, type annotations, unsigned integer math that is gentrified for dynamic languages, repeated annotations for the Java EE world, and time APIs and NASR, well, which we celebrated with cake. We like cake. Uh, Lambdas, um, you can write code. Instead of loopy code like this, you can write code in a more functional manner like this with streams or parallel streams. You can find the hyper impl implicit parallelism. And um, the build process, I've already waxed poetic about that for quite a while. So this leaves us today, 2015, um, with Java 9 in the works, with Jigsaw, with the rep ball. If you haven't tried to write call which is the Java rep ball, it's quite impressive. So I encourage you to do so. And uh, now it's more with a partial ES6 support. People use more and more JavaScript, which I don't understand, but they do. And we have some huge performance improvements. So I'll talk more about JVMLS. And after Java 9, I'm not allowed to say Java 10, but after Java 9, we'll see value types of Project Valhalla for a function interfaces, which is Project Panama, Arrays 2.0, and the deterministic and low latency GC, which probably will be in the closed JDK commercial space, but they'll finally be there anyway. I've seen some pretty good uh, results already in the lab. So, I mean, this was long, but anytime during the week, you can hit me up for QA and if there's time left, but someone else can talk. This is my 20 years of runtime journey. We'll see, we'll see how, how fun I have being a dot commie. Maybe I'll come calling back in six months. I don't know. Thank you for listening. Thank you.
you could have got a real mic as well if you wanted to. Yeah, I got wired up this time. So yeah. yeah. Right, so, um, yeah. look at it here. Marcus and I got long yeah. into the uh, same slot. And, uh, uh, however, what I wanted to talk about was uh, something entirely different. Uh, so, uh, I was, uh, I, was going to be, I was going to be technical, really, and the uh, question is uh, how, how deeply are you guys interested in uh, learning about, uh, about uh, NASCAR and what NASCAR does under the hood? Very deep, right? Hmm? Very deep, right? What do you mean? Everyone wants like the maximum technical depth. Well, I suppose so. It's just... Uh, right, so... Uh, because at this point, they don't really want to be uh, terribly formal about it. Just, uh, just maybe use these remaining twenty minutes for uh, something, uh, something along these lines. So, uh, just hands up. Uh, who has seen White Coat before? Okay, excellent. That's oh, very good. Okay, cool. Thanks. Let's move. Yeah. Let's <laughs> imagine. Who wrote White Coat? Next question. Sure. <laughs> Excellent. Should I be uh, facing the cameras or facing? No, 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 this oh, you're taking the screenshot. Okay. Want to know anywhere else? Yeah. Okay. Um, who has been using tools to? Uh, well, who has who has been writing code that emits bytecode? All right. Excellent. Uh, what do people use these days? ASM. Everyone uses ASM, right? There's nothing else than ASM. Using something else than bytecode. Yes. Jail assist. Jail assist. Okay. Jail assist, I think actually. Much easier than us. Alright, that's actually a very good point that uh, I might look into it. I saw that I'm going to write my own and bike. There's another one. Bike buddy. Bike buddy. Okay, there's another one from Raphael, uh, Bike Buddy. Bike Buddy, okay, that's, a, that's another one. Uh, I think I got stuck with uh, Apache and the Bytecode Engineering Library, PCL. Yeah, back in the day. I think so. Something on top of it. That was the first one, and then ASM came along, and then I sort of uh, probably developed a bit of a Stockholm Syndrome and just uh, stuck with ASM, I guess. Yeah, French so. engineer. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, I uh, found things that we do in NASCON is uh, when. Uh, uh, so, NASCON currently is uh, purely bytecode compilation frameworks, so we don't have an interpreter layer at all. Uh, we parse JavaScript, we compile it to bytecode, and then we run this. Uh, fun thing that we arrived at is we do not actually emit bytecode for any function before it is invoked for the first time, so we defer compilation. One of the reasons that we defer compilation is that we do type specializations. Uh, we are in a dynamic language, so if you have a function f that takes an argument and then returns the its square, so just returns x times x, then if you invoke it with an int argument, then we will generate a specialization for an int argument. The next time you invoke it for a double argument, we will generate a specialization for a double argument. And if you invoke it with an object, then we will generate code that will invoke the value of property on the object twice multiply the two results because it might be side effect and it would actually return the same value uh, both times and then return that. Um, so that's one of the one of the things that we do is uh, lazy compilation plus type specialization and input parameter types. Well think about it as a, as, as basically um, uh, method overloading uh, only in dynamic ways. Yeah, what does that mean? Yeah, uh, what do you want to say? Alexi, what do you want to say? Yeah. Yeah. How does he say something? He Alexi, say something. something. Talk he, to us, Alexi. If he tweaks something, I'll let you guys know. All right, then. Cool. How did you know that he raised his hand? Uh, he wrote because Twitter. you could see it. Can you see him raise his hand? No. <laughs> Just look at the screen. Man, this is total spiritual science feeling here. <laughs> <laughs> Alexi, talk to us. <laughs> So another uh, crazy thing that we, oh yeah, and actually we even run the program that way, so uh, um, uh, up until the point that you execute the top level program, because just a function will actually compile it when you execute it. It seems like it doesn't make sense because you will execute the top level program anyway, it's just that in the generic scheme of things we would have had to actually make a specialization to have the program run eagerly. So if you 
quite well. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And uh, another thing that we have is uh, this craziness that we call, uh, well, optimistic typing, which is really the optimizing compilation, where JavaScript is notoriously hard to type, right? So uh, what we do is, well, that's is actually pretty smart by now. We, um, we actually try to prove as many types statically as we can. So local variables are statically inferred. Uh, their types are statically inferred. Of course, their types are statically inferred for a range within the program. So it's not like in Scala or Java that we infer the type of a local variable and stays fixed. It might be uh, we infer the type for a particular region of the live range of the, of, of the function. And then if you reassign that same variable to the string, then later on it might be a string, even though it wasn't in before. And we do all the craziness with type joins at uh, control flow join points, and you know, the, the, the whole compiler shebang uh, is in there. And for all the types that we cannot prove, because there's a lot of those, right? So in JavaScript, uh, you have no idea what the function will return. You have no idea what will be the type of a property that you read. You have no idea what will be the type of a value you retrieve from an array element. You can't know. And uh, so what we do there is we call it optimistic typing because we have a bytecode that just says, well, you know, let's hope for the best. Maybe it will be a 32 bit integer. So that's the kind of bytecode that we generate. Now, if you have generated bytecode, you know that uh, you cannot, if the assumption proves wrong, you retrieve an array element and it's a double. You cannot continue running that same code because it would then, if you wanted to multiply it with something that's already on the stack, you would do a demul. Sorry, with the IML, if it was an int, but if we got back a double, then the expectation is something entirely different. The bytecode shape is no longer valid. So what we have at that point is uh, an amount of time. But what we have at that point is uh, we have an, uh, well, a slightly elaborate set of exception handlers that we, uh, at that point, these property getters can throw an exception. We go back to the caller, and the caller is linked in such a way that we just derail back into the into the compiler, we generate a slightly deoptimized version of that particular function, and then we also generate a one-time continuation because in the high-level semantics of the program, this all needs to be transparent, right? And then we jump back into the continuation, and the continuation might then itself run into a next call site that will deoptimize on its own. So we just basically do this cascading deoptimization until we reach a stable shape for the code where it the current data flow can pass with it with all the types. And that might get invalidated sometime later on again, but after a while it's really stable. Which also means that optimistic typing is actually super fa fast when it warms up, but of course its warm up characteristics are bad right now. And that's something that we've been working on to, uh, to improve, but if you're interested in more details about it, then just hit me up afterwards. Or go to JVMLS because I have to yeah, catch me anyway. I'm happy to rant about this. Marcus is happy to rant about it as well, so you can catch him too. As long as it's rants. As long as it's rants, yes. He does rants. I, I can be more civilized. All right, thanks. By the way, we just wanted to say, he does my